Okay, so when you're ready, you can come back into the Zoom. Would somebody like to share what they experienced during the meditation? I mean, this this thing where I'm saying, you know, don't try to change anything. I wonder if you understand what I mean by that. Probably many of you experience that between the first looking, the second looking, and then the third looking, that things change by themselves. So even something like a body pain will change in quite a short time. The, mo the movement of this change is basically towards the self, towards your essence. So it moves by itself towards the essence. We're only doing for 15, about 15 minutes. So if, if you see a movement happening, then it's quite possible if you would sit for longer, you would get a much bigger effect. And the thing about not uh, changing anything is that we've got a big temptation that we want to change something because it, we, we have more kind of spiritual ideas and um, we know that we're not supposed to have too many thoughts. So when we get too many thoughts, especially if they're not particularly nice, then there's a big temptation that we want to try to kind of stop the thoughts. And... Uh, if you try to do it, you'll see that although it's a kind of common thing to try to stop the thoughts, it usually doesn't work very well. And if you don't try to stop the thoughts, you simply accept the thoughts uh, and keep looking, keep watching, bringing your awareness, you will find that they change by themselves. And it basically, as I said, it, it moves away from the thoughts into, into your essence. So this is also a kind of uh, suggestion for how you live your life. Because if you can live your whole life in the same let go as we're doing with this meditation, where you simply accept what's happening and whatever your idea is about that particular moment, that you should be more happy, you should be hotter, you should be colder, you should be drier, whatever, whatever, whatever your idea is that you bring into the moments of your life, the much better approach is to simply accept what is happening in your life in every moment. Because if you can do that, then you will find yourself more and more simply living in your essence. And there in your essence, there's not much happening really. And tonight we're going to focus on the mind and I'll go more into this, uh, what I've just been saying, because the mind is somehow the crux of the spiritual work, I could say. So, uh, Marcel, you wanted to share? Yes. Um, so I had this energy phenomena in the, in the forehead, firstly which subsided after the first phase into a nice, very comfortable silence, stillness, with a few f thoughts about the day emerging. And when all of this subsided, some feeling of, of amness, of I amness came. And when I gave it my, my total attention, this also disappeared and I felt like and it felt like I'm just some wavy thingy. You what? 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 You were what a baby? No, I became some some wave, uh, wave waves or something. Yeah. Okay. Like, All right. Tense. And then it stopped the meditation. Ah, oh, right, right. Okay. Good. Good. And uh, looking at you right now, I mean, I can see that you're very calm. And probably you had a busy day because you're busy with the guest house and the guests. So I can imagine you had some kind of strong moments or dramatic moments during the day. 
But right now, after just 15 minutes sitting together with a group of people, then you become very quiet. I'm always touched that this Zoom meeting has this strong effect for everybody because I always had the idea that in, 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 if we were all in one room, you can understand why the energy would be supporting each person. But through the, the computer, through the internet, it's always a bit surprising how effective it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, would anybody else like to share? Somebody who never shares, maybe? I can't ask Lakshmi because she always shares. She can have a night off tonight. Mm. Atna, maybe Atna would like to. She looks like she's sitting in a beehive or something. Do you like to share something, Atma? There were many thoughts in the meditation. And um, I always could see um, a thought was coming and then I saw that this thought was there and immediately the next thought was coming. So I saw that my mind is very, very clever to, uh, yeah, to pull me always into, into another, Another so, uh, another thought, um, but yeah, sometimes I recognize this. That was good. Yeah. Yeah, and and also you don't have to change it. You know, you just have to um, give yourself every day at various moments of the day. You have to give yourself. A moment where you basically repeat what we're doing now and that will have an effect through the day i mean it's it's mm. all right you're you're very young and you're starting out on a on a wonderful inner journey you seem very determined to go on this journey it's very touching because in the last year you had some moments where you might have disappeared but you didn't and um, that's wonderful. So there is there is an inner inner something driving you, you know, which is making you realize that you don't want to accept the ordinary society life. You want to discover who you are, and this this will definitely be enough to take you to who who you are. But you're very young, and you're starting out, and you have to be a bit patient. You know, it's not it's not so quick that your mind will become calm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I, I also was very ashamed of um, all this, uh, those thoughts which came. It um, felt so robotic thing. Yeah. So there was also this kind of thought. But then I jumped over this and... Yeah. Right. right. But you can also be kind to yourself and be kind of patient with yourself that this work goes on for years not not days or weeks you know it's it's it gets better and better and better and you've got enough years because if you spend the next uh, i can't remember how old you are but 24 maybe if you spend the next six years uh, which would be a reasonable period you'd still be so young you know? so the whole of your life is waiting for you and is anyway continuing now every day and uh, when you turn up at 30, being uh, able to live quietly inside, that's an enormous achievement for the human life, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So unless somebody is gung-ho, I think we'll, uh, I'd like to get into tonight's subject because there's quite a lot to talk about tonight. So we've come to the third chapter of this book, Pointless Joy. 
I think everybody has a copy or is familiar with this book. And maybe Marcel and Hannah, if you don't have this book, we can give you a copy and ask Owen to give you a copy of this book. And um, so the beginning of the chapter, there's a quotation. Everybody's mind wants things to stay the same. Mind has an investment in staying as it is. And so it does not know much about letting go. It is important that we see how our minds will try and sabotage our transformation when we start the inner work. So this is one of the reasons you have to be patient in the beginning, because in the beginning, the mind is still very um, active. And as, a, as I've just said, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't really want to let go. It doesn't want really to, something new. The mind is being very conditioned in a certain way. And we've become very attached to that way. We call that way me. So it's not so easy to go from me, which is a whole package, to nobody. So you have to be patient. You have to be patient and you have to do the inner work. And, um, and for sure, everybody on this screen tonight is completely sincerely interested in this journey. And therefore, you have absolutely every chance to, to get the result you want. I mean, I mean, look how we're 25 people, I think, tonight, 20 people. And uh, this is like, a, for me, I, I look at you and I see that you, you have something that hardly anybody has. In, in, if you consider the whole of Europe, you're a small, unique kind of group. So enjoy being a unique member of this group. Yeah. Okay, so I've selected this um, quotation from Buddha. It's better to conquer yourself than to win a thousand battles. Then the victory is yours. It cannot be taken from you. Not by angels or by demons, heaven or hell. Peace comes from within. Do not seek it without. So everybody, we all know this, and you've all made this commitment to go on the inner journey. And uh, you must know your friends, even if your friends say that they're spiritual people, you may, in fact, see that they're not really committed to this inner journey. There are so many people calling themselves spiritual or they have the idea that they're living a spiritual life when um, they're not, actually. They're not. Because it's not so easy. It's not an easy thing. Well, in one way, it's very, very simple, but simple things are not necessarily easy. And so we have to be patient. And we're very lucky here. We have a group of people who are committed to this inner journey and therefore support each other. And that's always touching in when we have these Zoom meetings that even through the, through the internet, we're able to support each other. And I think everybody has learned what's written in this chapter, which is that it doesn't work to try to change the world. So on the day that you're going on a picnic, you plan that it should be a sunny day, and then it's not a sunny day, and then you, you get into a lot of energy about that. You're thinking about why, why isn't it what you wanted it to be? How can I change this situation? Yeah. So we put a lot of energy, if we're not careful, when we become a bit unconscious, we put a lot of energy into wanting to change the outside because that's how we've been brought up and so everybody when they don't really understand is assuming that you can change the world outside to fit with what you want you know yesterday we had an eighth birthday party for my daughters and of course um, we probably all can remember when we've had 
our birthdays, that very often we want this day to be particularly special. And then things happen and it seems that it's not going to be special or it isn't special because it didn't work the way we wanted it to work. You know, we wanted this kind of present and we got that kind of present or whatever it is. Now we, our best friend didn't come to the party and then somebody we didn't like came to the party and made a drama and blah, blah, blah. So we all know these moments. And a birthday party is, or birthdays is, is a very strong moment because as we've been growing up, we probably were conditioned with the idea that birthdays should be very, very special. And um, yeah, we had a little drama yesterday with one of my daughters. But in the end, she had such a great time. And today she's so energized and so happy that we, we don't have to worry about all this stuff, you see. There is no perfect way. And we have to accept the way it is. And that's one of the beautiful things about our community. If you remember last night in the party, towards the end of the party, there was a man, a man coming, a Russian man actually, well, a Ukrainian man, came into the party. Uh, he was a friend of, um, well, he a bit, a bit of a friend of the girls. And um, today he was telling Om how he was very touched because he was rushing from work, having a shower, coming to the party. And he said, you know, well, we could all feel he was pretty stressed. I think we all could feel that. But he, for him, he was telling today how touched he was by the energy of everybody, how he felt everybody was very sincere and very much, um, how can I say, uh, what did he say? Oh, maybe you. you... <clears throat> like everybody was very much themselves, completely themselves. And he said somehow he, he, he feels like he's completely lost touch with that. Right. right. The true yeah, authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, we don't know what will happen with that man, but he's actually. Um, becoming a bit involved with the community through a business project. And, you know, he's obviously somebody who, who, is, who can be possibly touched. So, of course, we're not going to try to recruit him into the community or something. But when he's touched like that, it can open up something inside him so that, in fact, in his life, he will look and to understand this other, other way. He won't forget that moment coming into the party. Uh, but there'll be like an intrigue for him, probably, that he wants to understand that. So this is, this is uh, basically, this is how it works. Yeah, We have our conditioning and we go along and everybody around us has a similar conditioning. And then you meet somebody or you meet a group of people like he met us and something gets touched inside and then we want to understand it. And our suffering basically comes from us wanting to change it on the outside. We, if we try to change things on the outside, then for sure we're going to suffer. And you can see how that correlates, you know, how we create our own suffering by thinking of the past, for example. If only I had given more flowers to my boyfriend or my girlfriend, then everything would have been fine. And I just didn't do that. I didn't understand how important flat were. And so I just, you know, and then you can you can go into a lot of suffering, but it's, it's all happening in your mind. It's not a real suffering. It's a suffering completely created in your own mind. And this is of course a bit tragic because uh, we can easily end up completely identified with the mind and the thoughts in the mind. And we can go through through our life for years and years. Many people go through their whole life suffering a lot, but not knowing that they're creating this suffering for themselves. Okay. And uh, probably with Buddha, everybody knows something about Buddha. 
Um, I don't know if you realize, but he was actually a real guy. He wasn't like probably Jesus was. He was a real guy. 2,000 years ago, he was walking around in the north of India. He's reputed to have been the son of a king, so he was brought up very richly. And um, the story that Osho used to tell is that somehow he slipped out of the palace one day and was shocked by the suffering which he witnessed when he went out into the community. And so he decided that he wants to understand about life in a different way than just being in the a special person in the palace. And apparently when that happened, he'd already married. His father had already found him a lovely wife. They already had their first child. And without saying anything, he slipped away one day and left his wife. So some years passed, quite a few years passed, and uh, he um, achieved what he had hoped to achieve. And in that situation, he came back to the palace. And of course, his wife was pretty pissed off. And she basically accosted him and said, well, uh, you know, very good, very nice, but couldn't you have actually done this? Couldn't you have achieved this? And also stayed in the palace. And of course, it, Julia. And of course, his answer was yes. This is the honest answer. He could have done that in the palace. You can do it in the society. You don't have to live in a special spiritual community. But very few people ever manage that. I, I, I don't know how true that is because it's very difficult to survey that. But my own impression is that it's very difficult, actually. And it would have been very difficult for him because probably his wife wanted to have, you know, five more children and uh, you can imagine his life and he was uh, going to be the king and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, his life almost certainly would have been, he would have been pulled into the outside. So although it, it could have been possible, it, it's not easy. So it's often very helpful to change your environment. And as you know, I play the game also of changing your name because names also, if you, if, you, if you look at your name, they also have very strong effects in holding you to some of your mind structures. Anyway, so Buddha was kind of an interesting guy. And then we move on to a quote from Swami Dayananda. Um, <clears throat> so that Swami Dayananda is a very well-known uh, Vedanta scholar. He was, uh, he was the best or the, the most known student of another very well-known Vedanta master. And he, Dayananda, developed uh, an ashram, in, I think even two maybe ashrams in, in the United States. One was in the East Coast, one was in the West Coast. He had two uh, big ashrams in India. One was in Rishikesh and one was in a place called Kombature in the south of uh, maybe about eight hours south of where we used to have our retreats. And um, it was it was interesting because he was a very unusual man, actually quite a famous spiritual master. And um, somehow we, we got a good connection with him. So I had heard about him and I wanted to interview him. I interviewed him for the Indian Master's book. You can see an interview with him um, in the Indian Master's book. And... When I went to interview him, he knew that I'd come from Ramana Mahashi. And uh, apparently there'd been some sort of scandal because he had said at some point that Ramana Mahashi wasn't really so special. Uh, almost every housewife in India is living in that way that Ramana was living. He, I, mean, I don't remember exactly what he said. He said something like this. And then, of course, the Ramana Ashram people or people associated with the ashram 
were very angry about that. And so there was a bit of a thing. So when I came there to interview him, he was very, very suspicious of the music. And in fact, he wouldn't answer my questions. I couldn't ask him any questions. He took all my questions, all my written questions, and he created like one big question. And then he talked for maybe an hour in answering this kind of combined question, which he put together from my smaller question. And, um, but somehow that weekend, I remember somehow connect, there was some sort of celebration and we got involved and somehow, uh, I was always a bit scary about him, but uh, anyway, we got some very nice connection. And so for the next maybe five years, every year during our retreat, we used to go to visit him, which was really very lovely. So many, many people, I don't think anybody on the screen tonight met him, probably not. Oh, in here, I met him. Yeah. Yeah. So he, um, he used to offer three, I mean, just to give you some idea about his power, he offered a three year course, including um, food and accommodation for free to about 30 people. Or maybe even a few more than 30. I can't, I don't know exactly, but he, and he did many of these. I think he did about 20 of these three year courses during his life. And when you think about the cost of that, um, it's pretty amazing actually, because even in India, it's pretty expensive to support so many people. But he he was so connected in a way, he was a bit like the Pope of Pope of India. I mean, they don't have popes in India, but he would be that sort of level um he often represented india at these international spiritual meetings um so he had he had the possibility of being supported by many companies and i remember on one of these visits we had a, a businessman from hamburg with us and his question was what what would you do with a million um a million dollars or how, yeah, something something about a million dollars. And uh, he immediately answered and said, oh, just a few days ago, I had a million dollars. And so it was clear from the way he answers that his money was completely not the point for him. And this is true of many of the more famous Indian masters. They get tremendously supported by uh, business people who want their businesses to be more successful or rich people who want their uh, daughter to marry, make a good marriage or some things like that. You know? And this is something that, of course, is possible in the West, but is, 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 is the way it works for most, um, in most of the ashrams in India. They're very supportive by the community. But they pay a price for that, of course, because then they have to give blessings for the marriages they have to give blessings for the successful businesses and so on so this is uh, not so nice so he's talking in this uh, passage we're talking he's talking about desire <clears throat> and he's talking about the longing for truth and he's suggesting that this longing for truth is a bit different from a normal desire. <clears throat> so this idea that if we, if we have a desire to get something, then this thing that we get will make us happy. So if we have this mechanism inside, this is a very difficult sabotage. And of course, this is again very common that the mind is always wanting to change something we're sitting in this chair, we think maybe over there, if we sit over there, we'll be a bit better over there, or or whatever. So uh, these kind of, this kind of desiring, this kind of desiring mind, which um, we all understand, I think everybody on the screen tonight understands is not the way to go, but it's also not so easy to not go there, because this is as we've been growing up, you know, maybe mummy offers you a sweetie, you know, if you're a good girl, you get a sweetie. So if we get, we're always looking to get something that then makes us feel a bit better. Mm. 
And the last sentence I, I have there is that, that this longing that he's suggesting, the, the longing is like a final desire to become one with truth. And that this longing is very important. And it, once you, you once you come to the truth, this longing will just disappear. I experienced this myself because <clears throat> when I was 30, somehow I started my inner journey. And when I got to about 47, 48, um, <clears throat> after years of meditation, after years of looking, after years of um, trying, to, trying to get it, trying to get this very important thing that I felt I would get if I keep doing the inner work, suddenly it happened. And uh, as soon as it happened, all my longing, all my desires to get this thing completely disappeared. I was shocked. From one day to the other, completely disappeared from inside me. It had been there for, I don't know, 15, 17 years, quite strongly inside, keeping me going, keeping me going, and making it my priority. And then something happened one day, and the next day, you know, completely gone. And I never, I never again, it never came back. This, this sort of longing for something never came back. And I never really had a question. The, the, the questions just stopped. <clears throat> and it just happens by itself. So when, when this, something like that would happen, you know that you've come to the, the conclusion of the of the inner work in one sense of it but of course a new work starts ha 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 and this work goes on and on so this is uh, swami dayananda <clears throat> actually maybe i stop for a moment is there some something to talk about from what the buddha says about desire and now what dayananda is saying Anybody like to um, respond? I'm still hoping to the day when everybody waves. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. That's that's my desire for the future. You see, I desire the future. One day, everybody will be waving their hands around. Everybody will want to engage, you know, in something. But um, perhaps one person would like to. Nobody. Oh, we have somebody. Rana. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was um, a few days ago, I was at my family. And um, this is always a good mirror to see how much basically. Yeah, somebody is expecting something from somebody. Right, right. And and you 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 grown up with this, so you're completely conditioned to to have desires or expectations to other people, how they behave, or maybe to get something or. Um, yeah, and I find it very interesting to to see this um, so strongly, so obviously. Yeah, I mean that situation of of going back to the family, I think, is a, always going to be a very strong uh, mirror. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Maybe we should ask Atma. Atma, I think, just spent a few days with her family. Looks like it's your your evening, Atma. Uh, you'd like to share something about your visit? 
Where is she? Ah, oh, she's there in the dark almost. So did you see anything, Atma, about your conditioning when you went back to your family? Hello? <clears throat> Me now. Um, so I think I was observing and there were no no strong feelings about uh, um, <clears throat> about something. So nothing triggers me in this moment um, when I was at the family. So that was um, very nice. And it was easy to be with them. So yeah, I d I don't know if I I was like uh, just very good in um in the distance, like an observer, or I I don't know when what kind of state I was there actually. Well, I mean, in the last time you've been getting in touch with the fact that there's often a kind of resistance. Not being maybe particularly resistant to something, but just kind of resistance, a kind of no coming up automatically almost. Yeah? And so very likely that no, because it's been rather common over the last year for you, maybe this was something you might have seen in the family dynamic yeah um so i i observed it definitely um with my brother we sat uh, um around the table and um then my mom was asking him something can you do this and so he said oh no i don't want to do it so but then i uh, yeah i saw that he all also is not saying often yes and also my sister and I saw that there is not much yes in this family. <laughs> so was your mother a bit bossy? No, she's not bossy at all. No, she she she. So where did this no come from? If she was your father, probably wasn't bossy either, was he? Mm -mm. Not so. So, so I mean, my mom did every is doing everything for us. So when she's asking for help, then it's um, like, okay, um, that's unusual. So I, I I don't I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe when the mother is doing everything, you know, she's cooking, she's tidying up your bedroom, she's, uh, I don't know, washing and ironing your clothes, every, every little thing which you could also do, that she's doing it, then in a way you're brought up with a kind of golden spoon, and so you're brought up with a feeling that <clears throat> a sort of prin prince or princess kind of energy that, you know, you're, you're being served so much, you should get what you want. Yeah? And of course, in the reality of life, when you're facing the reality of life and it's not being filtered through your parents, for example, then of course, you can't get and have what you want all the time. There's going to be a lot mm. of stuff that happens, which is maybe not what you really choose to happen. Yeah. I saw, um, or I, I also found out from one session that I also say no because I, I, I wanted to get something else from my mom, another kind of response than just that she's doing everything. And I want to get in touch um, with her in another way. Right, right, right. So you wanted to change the outside, actually. Yeah. 
and this is what we do all the time. You know? we, we always want to change what is happening around us to something we, we feel is what we really want. Um, but when you can come into a, an acceptance that what is happening is what's supposed to happen, life becomes much more simple, in fact. I think you also got in touch with that this year. Yeah. I mean, you're doing this situation with going out to, to, to sell honey in shops. <clears throat> and I, I can remember sometimes last year when you, you, you came into a big no about doing it. And then you would go out and you'd sell lots and lots of honey. So it's somehow what actually happened was very different from what you had imagined was going to happen. Yeah? Is that right? Yeah, and I, I don't want to be the somebody which sells honey. And I, there's, it's, it's, um, the outside is, uh, it's, it's fine. It's, um, actually everything is good. And the people buy the honey and uh, it's, it works. Yeah, but but my inner world. You've got something to do with why it works. Yeah. You probably present yourself in the shop in a very nice way, and uh, you're kind of obviously a very honest girl, and they trust what you're telling them, and you're offering something very nice. And so even though your inner uh, decision is you don't want to be doing it, actually you do it quite good, I think. Yeah, and this is this this thing. Um, I in a way i know that i do it good and um i can be easily with the people coming into kind of energy um but in another way i don't want to see it and i i i cannot feel it very deep inside me that i that i'm also happy about this that i do it this is good. And do you think if you, if the community came up with the perfect job for you, which you absolutely wanted to do, do you think this would uh, change immediately or do you think it might not change immediately? It, it will change immediately um, for sure for, I don't know, maybe just a certain time, but it will immediately change. Well, I've noticed that you tend to have this resistance to many things you could be doing. Like you, you love you, you like nature. You like the garden. You like nature. You like the animals. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you're not in resistance about the animals. I mean, um, when I go through the garden. And um, I'm not in a good, um, I'm not really in touch with myself or I'm not in this, in this peaceful being. Then I see, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. I feel very bad that I don't have time for this. And I'm, I just pass this and this, what I see in the garden and everything. And then I, I have also the feeling I would love to do it, but I need to do other things. And also, every time when I go um, past the animals, I see that they need that or that they need that. And it, it, it's weird. it hurts so much. It, it's, it's such a subtle but big, big pain, actually, that um, I, I don't give myself permission to, um, to have this time to take care. This is this is a symptom of your resistance, isn't it? <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, is it really true that you don't have time? I mean, time is what is time? <clears throat> That's my idea that I don't have time. 
Yeah, it's, it's an idea. That I always that, that I always on honey tour, and so I don't have time for um, to coming into really take care of the things here, and I'm always busy with the, the other. Reality, the reality of the honey tour is that it's a maximum two days a week, and mostly it's only one day a week. So the other five days or six days, you have, of course, enough time to do whatever you feel is necessary. You just don't do it. For example, simple example, well, I have many examples, but one simple one is the, these, these um, flower baskets hanging on the balcony. They've got these creepers hanging down and we discussed what to do with them maybe six months ago. I suggested you you tie them up, you know, but you never did it. Oh, I thought you. I so, thought I needed to cut them. I what? cut it. I cut it them. You cut. I'm. Them. Yes. Well, that was the opposite to what was being suggested. You know. Okay. Yeah. And the latest one is the water bowl that the white pheasant uses, who I particularly love. We have a deep friendship with the, I have a deep friendship with the white uh, the, the pheasant with the red red nose. You know? He's been hanging out with me for about 15 years now. I was <clears throat> watching him tonight. There was, there was a big group of people in the courtyard and he was kind of there. And I thought he would probably run away because of the energy of the people. And then I was amazed that he came very close to one woman, about one meter away. And I thought when he realized, he would kind of dash away. But when he realized, he came closer to this woman. I was amazed. So he has no, after living there for so many years, he has no longer any kind of security issues, which is very unusual for pheasants because generally pheasants are, um, you know, hiding in the bushes, you can say. So he's become one of the uh, shining members of the community. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Anybody else like to um, engage? Okay, Krishna. Hello. Hello. I, I just remember sitting after when I had a wish a real deep wish, like going to a party or meeting friends. And uh, I asked my mother to go there. And I think she came up with half an hour, an hour intellectual explanation why I should not do this. So this is uh, something which is very deep and my mind sometimes imitates it like intellectually telling me what I should do or not do, I get a bit confused then, but in the moment, I also feel that it doesn't disturb me so much anymore. It's like, it is there, but I still enjoy the work. I still am with what is there in the moment. So more and more come to that, that whatever it was disturbing is just, uh, going to the background not so important it's just the airport right right there's no influence it's very good and it's very um yeah it gives a lot of space to me to to enjoy this what is there right right and you're you're living in this beautiful place in uh, spain is the sun shining down there Yes, very much. Yeah. Very strong sun. <laughs> okay, well, it, it hasn't really started here, you know, maybe, maybe it's coming, but uh, only occasionally. Yeah. I'm sure it's... Uh... Can you swim in the pool? Is the water warm enough? 
today I saw already somebody swimming and I was in with my arms both and I felt that the pool is already quite warm. Yes, I would like to jump in. Right, right. Oh, very good. Yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> so I think I go on with the last, the, the last chapter. <clears throat> we have a quote here from Papaji, who was my particular master. You are ripe for enlightenment when you want nothing else. In order to be born, you have to spend nine months getting bigger and bigger. For enlightenment, you have to get smaller and smaller until you disappear completely. I remember another teacher, actually a Western teacher, I was talking to about exactly the same subject. And he was he was basically he was saying, well, you know, you've come you've come to this priority once you don't want anything from the world, when you don't want a better job, you don't want a better wife or a better girlfriend or a better husband. When you you're not looking for anything from the world. In that moment, you're ripe to come to your essence. That's the criteria for the spiritual work, you see. And this is, of course, very challenging and uh, not so easy, actually, because it seems like we're living in a candy store. And in this candy store, there are so many varieties of good stuff. And here we are, and we would like to go out and taste all these different candies. But of course, um, there's no end to that. There's so many candies that you can never you can never complete the work if you're just going to go and try all the candies. So, of course, that's basically how everybody is living. They're caught up in this story of desire that if they become richer if they become a bit better known they become a very good singer or whatever it is you know they've traveled around the world a few times or there are so many possibilities and then we can easily come out with the idea that if we achieve that then we can be happy and of course uh, that's a huge illusion and Unfortunately, many people are caught in this illusion. But I would say almost everybody on this screen, and when I look around on the screen here tonight, I don't think any of you are very much into that. So um, that makes you a very unusual group, I would say. And Papaji was talking about this in a similar way to the other guys that he was saying that, that what we would come to, this longing, has to be the last desire. So it's like all the other desires are complete. We, we give them up. We don't want any more. And we, what we really want is to find out our essence and live in this essence, live in the peace of this essence. I remember one friend of mine was uh, she she often used to go to Papaji's house and just sit in the living room, and he would he would be coming in and out, whatever he was doing. Maybe he he often would sit at his um, he would sit at the table, maybe reading the newspaper or watching cricket on television, something like that. Very sort of ordinary. And she was also sitting there on the floor in the living room, enjoying the connection. And then one of the one of the other people who often was in the house opened the, the door and said, I'm going shopping now. Does anybody want something? And this woman, this friend of mine, she said, Yes, yes, could you get some incense? You see, very small thing, very small desire. And then this person left the room. And then Papaji exploded, you see, he completely exploded on this woman. See, you're sitting there silently for some hours, maybe, and then somebody walks in 
asking if anybody needs something and immediately boom you need something you need some, this incense okay it's a very small thing but it shows that this uh, energy of the outside the desire and so on it hasn't faded away yet <clears throat> So we tend to experience this a lot in our lives, yeah, that we want to change something. Anybody now would like to um, engage me, engage in a talk, and ask a question, share something? Okay. Daniel's very busy tonight. Who's it going to be first, Kieran or Carly? Maybe ladies first, yeah? So it should be Carly first. Yeah. So um, I feel really there's a, a different um, energy inside me between this desire in general and this longing for truth because this desire feels like getting something like getting something from outside and filling something up uh, which was like my whole life like this i felt like from one desire to another and um, always wanting to get something and this longing is more like losing feels much more light much more like <sighs> just yeah, losing. Letting go. Letting go, Letting go, losing. And yeah, it's just becoming much more attractive for me than the other thing. And this is something which I find quite fascinating in general, like that I can understand it with my mind for a long time. Yeah, it's not new information since the start of community, but it's like so, <clears throat> it's like so far away sometimes, or just, um, take so, so much time I'm really fascinated by this it's like shocking like how you can hear it for years and like this is maybe a question like how can it be so stuck in the system even if you understand it with your mind and feel like yeah that's it but something is not really that you really get it you know I don't understand why it's like this when did you join the community was it two years ago yeah like kind of two years ago because I remember, you know, a moment when you first joined the community. <clears throat> we went, we had gone to India and we were sitting on a bullet cart, or there were probably three bullet carts, and we were going around the mountain and you were talking to somebody and you were saying to them something like, oh, you know, my friends have gone to Berlin to play music in the street. I'd really like to do that. And I was completely shocked, you know, I'm sitting there listening to this conversation and we're, we're in this very spiritual place and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And your mind is, is desiring to go and play music in the street in Berlin. Yeah? And I think now after two years in the community, I don't think that happens so much, does it? No. I can, I can see these things clearly. It's, I think more an issue is now really letting go all this conditioning, but it's not much about what I desire or something. I noticed also now when Radha told about parents and asking this question, I this also get always when I go home, it's like, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what is your goal? What do you want to become? Or, And then I, I never found really an answer. Um, because, yeah, there is nothing really, except this be coming to the truth. And this feels like um, it's uh, very hard for people outside there, like um, even worried, like how can you not have goals or want to become something? And you can maybe see, see that after our talk tonight that these goals that people like to uh, like to have, yeah? these goals are also in the category of a big desire which if i achieve i don't know buying a special big house or that wonderful car 
I've always wanted to get a Ferrari or some red Ferrari or something, then that I'll then be incredibly happy if I get this red Ferrari or something. And this is, of course, um, an, an illusion, an enormous illusion, actually. It would be very yeah. inter interesting to, to know what these rich people who live in Monaco, you know, this this small country on the south of France, they have, I think, no taxes there. So it attracts a lot of very, very rich people who would mm. have taxes in their own country. And of course, these very rich people, they, they're very caught up yeah. in this whole game of desire. And so there's one very famous hotel down next to the casino. And outside the casino, there is a kind of, uh, I don't know really how to describe it, like a big car park. It's not really a car park. It's more special than a car park. And they have um, they have men who work there so that you drive your Porsche or your Ferrari, you drive it into this area. And then as soon as you stop, one of these men come and open the door of the car and then you step out and then the man takes your car and I don't know, he parks it in that place or he takes it to a, a proper car park somewhere. <clears throat> and so there's a parade, a parade of amazing cars coming there with, you know, sumptuous ladies, girlfriends getting out of the car, you know, with their rich boyfriend or husbands or whatever, you know, it's a completely social pinnacle kind of point, you know. And it would be very interesting to, to talk to those people and discover what, what actually they've achieved with this enormous wealth that they've achieved. So, okay, they've got the wealth and they're living in Monaco and they have a special car and they maybe have a special wife or special girlfriend, special husband, and they're about to go to the famous hotel for lunch or they're going to gamble in the, in the, in the casino. These are two very special uh, places in Monaco. And so actually, in the, you could say in the whole of Europe, this one place is very, very special, very kind of, very mm. concentrated wealth, kind of social extravagance, or I don't know how to describe it here. But it would be very interesting to really know a little bit about those people. I yeah. see what they're trying to tell other people but what is really going on inside them? Have they really achieved some inner peace? Have they achieved a, a deep happiness? Um, I can't help guessing that they probably haven't. They haven't. Mm. Yeah, I have also one kind of rich friend who is like a hairdresser for like more famous people. And he told me actually a few days ago he was um, doing a hair for a princess he couldn't tell me which princess but there was a party from this princess uh, where also um elon musk was even invited so like this kind of rage of people and he said it was such a shocking and what was the word um confusing uh, confusing energy there because it's like it's very fake and he could hardly meet the people he could hardly like they can all speak well, they have like these manners, then it's like more perform performance and uh, very little authentic, authentic behavior. So this is also my feeling, which I had also when we were in this art gallery, there's like this shiny outside, but inside they don't feel very grounded, happy or present even. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I don't know, it'd be inter an interesting project. You know. I was uh, watching, I think yesterday morning, I was watching X, and there was, there was a young man who was traveling around the United States, and he was interviewing old people, people in their 70s, or, or older even. I think he, had, he was talking to one woman who was 95, and he was asking them about their lives, you know. And it was very interesting, like, what do you regret now, looking back in your life? And so many of the people said something like you've just been saying, that they, when they were younger, they were desiring, you know, a special house, a special car or something, special partner, 
And now years later, when they're kind of comfortably, uh, they've got all these things and they're living very comfortably without any financial pressures, they've come to realize that actually that just didn't bring them at all what they expected to be getting from that. Mm. But they're already now in their 70s. So they're, you know, spent 30 years, maybe 40 years to get what they thought was going to make them very happy. And then they got it all. And then suddenly they realize it's not really important. So you're very young and so you're very lucky that you've already discovered this to some extent. And uh, this can set you up for a pretty amazing life. If you don't forget. You don't forget. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to forget. Very easy. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, Kieran. Ah, uh, no. No. Mm. Yeah, about desire, yeah. So during the days, it's most, I'm most busy with my thoughts, what to do next and uh, what not to forget and uh, what uh, yeah, the plan of the day and maybe the day of the day, day tomorrow and so on. But then when there's, that, there's a break or mostly in the night, then there is a, um, yeah, actually there's not so, not so much desires what I want. Yeah, there's apart from freedom. Yeah, but there's, uh, a lot of ideas also during the day. How should how should it be? Yeah. So I want an easy solution for a task. I want um, I want that it goes like this. Yeah. That the sun shines, or that uh, if I call somebody, the person's on the phone and says, "Ah, oh, everything is all right. I deliver the stuff tomorrow," and so on and so on. So this is ideas about um flow of life should be but um yeah this can make uh, it sometimes a bit um stressy but uh, sometimes happen things that are so unexpected and uh, life itself is, is gives a solution yeah and uh, for example uh, there was a day i urgently needed to go to the airport and I had no idea how to get to the airport in time and just in this moment uh, somebody arrived in the house who has been before in the house and says oh, I have time I can drive you to the airport and a lot of small things like this happened and um, so this was a bit like a, a teaching that um, what even if I want the sun to shine and it rains, there's it, it could also be right the right thing. Because then some something comes out and I can accept it and maybe it is much more beautiful, much than my idea. Yeah, this is uh, about letting go and trusting in life and not like putting my own idea into how this should be like this, because I think this is better. This is a bit ridiculous, but very often it works like this. It is inside here. You, you, have, <laughs> you have to live with a couple of young ladies, about eight years old, you know. So, <laughs> for example, today, um, Amelia came back from school and she got lots of presents yesterday. So. She had decided, you know, which of the presents she wanted to play with. But actually, um, when we opened the box, uh, I could a, a little bit help her with this new toy. But in the end, I, I couldn't figure out, you know, where to put the batteries or where to turn it on and so on. So I had to put, I put it on one side and said, we have to figure this out. You know, maybe you, you play with something else. <laughs> then I, I think I had a phone call or I don't know exactly. And then I was thinking, I wonder what she's up to. I wonder what she's doing now because, mm. you know, 
And so I went, you know, into her playroom and looked around the door and completely differently, you know. So this idea of playing with her presence had completely disappeared. And we have two horses. Each girl has a horse, you know, like a toy horse. It's big enough to sit on, but it's, you know, it's not very big. And she got these two horses and she got a hairbrush and she was brushing the hair on these horses. I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing nice. I'm doing their hair nicely, she said. Right? <laughs> so she was in some sort of game, fantasy game about these horses. And then later she put the horses on their side and one of the horses next to her bed, between her bed and my bed, there was a gap. She put one horse on the side and put a blanket over the horse. And the other horse she also put on the side. So I came in the room and I saw the horses on the side. And I said, what are you doing with the horses? Why are they on the side, you know? And uh, she said, oh, they're sleeping now. They're sleeping now. <laughs> so for her, she she managed to, to play very happily uh, with whatever was going on for an hour, maybe doing the brushing the horses and then putting the horses to sleep. And she got a lot of fun out of that. And all the new presents stayed in the bag. You know, she, hmm. she'd forgotten how that would be maybe what she was up to today, playing with the new presents. Hmm. So, I mean, it's so touching to see these moments. You know? So, hmm. She has this amazing capacity to be present. It's all when, when it really happens strongly, like today, it's very touching. Very mm. touching. Yeah. I think she's going to be my best student, actually. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, I mean, I think since, uh, since you've been in Denya now doing the renovation of that house <clears throat> and the garden and so on. I mean, I mean, along with other people who are helping you with this work, you've been constantly busy with that for now, I think one and a half years or something. And I Two. don't know. Huh? Three, Three and a half years nearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite... Three and a half years? I think so, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you're a very lucky boy there. Then. <sighs> anyway, so, uh, but I mean, there's an enormous change in that three and a half years. I don't know how much you can see this, you know. Just when I look at you right now, there's such a relaxed feeling there. <laughs> even, even you may not be feeling relaxed. And if I remember, you know, how you have been in the past, it's an amazing uh, transformation that's happened. Well, it's you, interesting. Are you aware of this or you don't have that? sense yes i have this I have this sense I have this sense also but it's it's always interesting to to watch what is happening yeah so mm. yeah about this desire there there is a it is more the ideas there's not not so much desire yeah there is the every day is full of thoughts even in the meditation, yeah, it's full of thoughts, but there is not, not so much uh, judgment anymore. Yeah, the, the, a thought is not dangerous. It depends what kind of thought it is. You know, if it's <laughs> a thought to do with very often in your case some sort of construction situation, do we put the pipe there or we put it on the other side? Or, I don't know. Do we put a one meter window? Or we put an eight hundred millimeter window. I mean. All these things are things that the mind needs to decide or needs to work out, you know. But these don't cause much uh, much suffering, actually. Because as soon as you've decided on the window, then it, it's gone. But that kind of thought, maybe I think in your case, you're going to have many such thoughts. But they're not really a problem. They're not really causing suffering. Uh, the, the, the suffering comes from the kind of thoughts uh, which are sort of connected to desire, you know. If I brought if I brought my girlfriend more flowers, or it would all have been fine, you know. I mean, these kind mm -hmm. of thoughts where we so easily can go into the past or occasionally in the future, these thoughts are always causing suffering. Actually, 
And so the lesson is to become clear that when you're not doing that, how much better it all is, how much your life improves just by not doing what is not a good idea. And of course, we've been conditioned to do what is not a good idea. It's completely out of the way that society um, has created for itself. Yeah, it's, it's about um, how to react on what is happening in life. Yeah. If uh, it's just like a step by step thought, then the thought is okay. Yeah, but if they have a momentum and then there's a story behind, then it's disturbing. But even this, there is um, much less um, judgment against myself and also against other people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you, when we first met you, I don't know, 15 years oh. ago, you were one of the world's great judges. But you were always judging yourself, which is makes it even worse. Yeah, and that that aspect of self judgment, which was so strong for you, I think that's pretty much gone completely, hasn't it? Not completely, maybe. But yeah, but it's good. To, yeah, but this judgment about this judgment is all is, is, that has gone. Right. <laughs> that's important. <laughs> right. Okay, okay, I think we uh, we probably now finish. Okay. Bye -bye. Ah. Okay, so I think that's, uh, that's enough for tonight. And um, we carry on with this um, chapter four next week. The heart chakra. Okay, so you can also, you know, dust your your copy of this book you can dust it down and uh, have a look inside and you can read tonight's uh, meeting in much more detail there maybe contemplate a bit and um, this this particular chapter about the mind is quite important i think yeah. i didn't say much about Papaji. i think everybody knows something about him and uh, he was my my personal teacher, and I spent about um, nearly five years living close by, going to his meetings, and uh, very much enjoying um, being in his his uh, ambiance. We had some personal meetings, which were always a bit strange. I could tell lots of stories about strange meetings with him. You never knew what would happen when you met him. Anyway. Okay, so thank you very much. See you next Thursday. Yeah.